Welcome to week four's lectures on Northanger Abbey. In today's uh, lecture session, I'm going to talk about uh, Gothic terrors and the education of Catherine Moreland that happens through her Gothic experiences in this uh, novel. Now, Austin draws a line between the Gothic novels of the 1790s, uh, usually set in the past in continental Europe and England in the 1790s, when Henry reminds Catherine that she should remember the country and the age in which we live. Remember that we are English, that we are Christians. Does our education prepare us for such atrocities? Do our laws connive at them? By the end of the novel, Catherine has a class learned not to take novels or herself so seriously. So this is a very um, interesting uh, moment in the novel when Henry Tilney chastises Catherine uh, Moreland for imagining gothic horrors uh, in his father's house um, that is Northanger Abbey. And in this um, comment of Henry Tilney, we can see Austin dividing the Gothic novels of the 1790s from the England of the 1790s. So uh, if you uh, remember uh, the spatialities that we come across in the Gothic novels of the 1790s are usually uh, from uh, continental Europe and uh, we can see how that contrast between England and the other is established through Gothic uh, narratives. So what is significant here is that um, those spaces in continental Europe are supposed to be spaces of atrocities. And, um, and, and what Henry Tilney is trying to communicate to this English woman, to this English girl, Catherine uh, uh, Moreland, is that um, we are Christians, we are English, our laws are better laws, are righteous laws, uh, and therefore um, you shouldn't imagine all these nightmarish uh, scenarios uh, to be taking place within an English um, structure, domestic structure. So when Henry Tilney is taken to task, these ideals are communicated to Catherine uh, Moreland and to the English readers who are uh, reading um, the pages of this uh, novel. So by the end of the novel, apparently Catherine uh, Moreland has uh, learned her lesson and at last she has also learned not to take novels or herself so seriously. Now, um, there's another uh, side to this um, concept of... Uh, gothic novels which were very popular in England uh, in the late 18th century and that idea is consumerism. Isabella Thorpe when she recommends the seven horrid novels to Catherine admits that she hasn't read them herself but has in turn been given the list by Miss Andrews. Isabella's interest seemed to be more that uh, she keeps up with the fashion and is able to make these recommendations than in her own enjoyment of novel reading. So uh, as you can see, there are several uh, related um, ideas here. One is that it was fashionable to read horrid novels, in other words, gothic novels in those times. And Isabella is keeping up with this fashion and um, even without reading those novels, she pretends to have read them and she passes the list to, um, uh, uh, to Catherine Molin herself. So uh, what is uh, interesting here is that, uh, you know, in polite society, uh, people do what other members of that society are uh, doing. And Isabella here is uh, imitating um, the fashionable trajectories of the people around her. And she is kind of introducing Catherine Moreland um, to into that polite society who um, has been reading um, these kind of novels as well. So one um, very clear thing uh, that gets apparent in this comment is that um, fashionable society read these fiction, they were consumed by this fiction and um, so in order to kind of um, participate in that um, group's interest, one has to have read um, these works. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. While Henry Tilney argues that England is different, its laws are different, its culture is different, uh, it shouldn't be compared to the heinous crimes uh, that take place in continental Europe. Um, 
these kind of um, hypocritical trajectories that are also ongoing where there is a consumption of a lot of uh, novels of this kind uh, by impressionable young girls. Now let's talk about the idea of the novel and female enlightenment. Terry Castle labels Northanger Abbey uh, a comedy of female enlightenment in which Catherine Morland is educated out of the sentimental Gothic tradition. After a time in Bath, her courtship by Henry Tilney, uh, Catherine realizes that she can think independently. She has learned to relish her intellectual freedom. Despite her in, uh, initial naivety and lack of reason and understanding, she becomes an unlikely thinking woman's heroine. This uh, comment is significant for uh, several reasons. One, uh, this novel is... Uh, perceived as a comedy of female enlightenment. It's a comedy because Catherine Morland makes a lot of errors um, when she spends time in Northanger Abbey. So that uh, for that reason, it's a comedy. And secondly, it's a novel of female enlightenment. Uh, we did approach this concept of female uh, learning in relation to the idea of uh, heroinism. Please remember that uh, in the previous lectures we compared, uh, you know, um, the male buildings roman to the female uh, buildings roman, in which um, heroines uh, such as Emily St. Aubert undergo a kind of growth trajectory and reach maturity at the end of the novel. So similarly. Just as in the Gothic um, uh, fiction, um, such as Mysteries of Adolfo, we have um, a, a kind of a, a buildings roman which is um, ongoing for uh, Catherine Morland in this particular novel. And uh, if you go back to that previous slide, you can see how um, Morland is being taught by Henry uh, Tilney. Henry Tilney becomes the, the educator here um, in some respects for Catherine Morlin and he reminds us of um, Mr. Knightley, um, the, the hero of uh, Emma, uh, the person um, that Emma marries at the end of the novel. So that similarity is the, uh, a female being educated by an ideal uh, male. So that's that's something we need to keep in mind here, which which kind of sets this novel apart um, in, uh, in in this kind of uh, study of Gothic novels. The other point that is being raised here is that uh, Catherine Morland seems to be kind of um, educated out of the sentimental Gothic tradition that she has completely kind of rejected that Gothic tradition at the end of the novel. That's something which uh, is debatable if you uh, read the novel um, very, very carefully. And uh, Catherine also undergoes a kind of a, a, a growing up process and by the end of it of course she can think independently uh, despite her uh, you know initial uh, naivety and uh, her um, impressionable nature which just uh, kind of takes and and believes in whatever appears to her um, in polite society so uh, at the end of the day she becomes a thinking uh, woman's heroine because of her strength of character and uh, courage now Catherine does read a lot of lurid gothic thrillers such as novels by Anne Radcliffe and M.G. Lewis, Matthew Gregory Lewis. Uh, of Radcliffe's uh, The Mysteries of Adolfo, she says, Oh, I am delighted with the book. I should like to spend my whole life in reading it. I assure you, if it had not uh, been to meet you, that's her friend Isabella Thorpe. I would have uh, not come. I would not have come away from it for all the world. Her desire never to leave the text places Catherine at risk. She begins to script her life and her interactions with people as though she were living in a gothic novel instead of in reality. So you can see. Um, two aspects um, in this uh, set of ideas. One is um, these Gothic novels are immensely gripping. Um, you know, uh, it is difficult to kind of um, put these books away even to socialize. Um, 
but uh, of course Catherine Morland makes an exception for her friend uh, Isabella Thorpe and the second is that because of her immersed um, you know uh, experiences immersive experiences um, in such uh, novels she kind of sees the world around her through those uh, lenses um, the settings the characters the plots of gothic fiction and therefore she is kind of scripting her experiences as if she were living in a fictional world as if she is a heroine um, who is kind of navigating the traps set for her by gothic villains so the reality takes a back seat and fictionality kind of comes to the fore um, and that has detrimental effects um, up to a point for Catherine Moreland in Northanger Abbey. Let's talk about gothic imagination. Catherine, her gothic imagination is given full reign in the environment of Northanger Abbey. One of the most memorable and well-crafted scenes in the novel involves many of the most familiar tropes of late 18th century gothic. A dark and stormy night, a sealed chest, a very excited and impressionable heroine. Uh, when the morning dawns and readers find um, Catherine let down by the secret of the sealed chest, which contains little more than a laundry bill, Austin clearly illustrates the humorous dangers of an excessive gothic imagination. So you can see how uh, Austin kind of harnesses exploits the gothic attributes um, such as a dark and stormy night um, we do have storms uh, if you remember the previous lectures uh, about Frankenstein uh, the storms have massive significance uh, in relation to the idea of the gothic there's a sealed chest um, and uh, of course there is this uh, very excited um, and curious heroine who wants to kind of uh, know get to the depths of the mystery in Northanger Abbey when she gets hold, when she gets hold of a piece of paper, uh, she thinks it might contain um, something horrible about uh, the past of Northanger Abbey, but she realizes that it's just um, uh, nothing more than a laundry bill. So when when she reads that, she she is kind of disappointed, and through that moment in the novel, Austin kind of uh, illustrates uh, the excesses of the gothic imagination on the part of uh, Catherine Moreland and even um, for the readers perhaps uh, because um, you know some readers reading the novel for the first time would have anticipated some dark secrets to come to the surface when uh, Catherine lands on that uh, piece of uh, um, you know, parchment and, and it's just um, you know a bill. So you can see how how uh, Austin takes um, Catherine Moreland to task for her excessive imagination and excessive imagination is a, a, a central trope of um, gothic uh, fiction you can see how i you know emily said albert also does possess um, a kind of a wild imagination uh, at certain moments and and all these kind of um, ideas about letting one's imagination run riot is a is an attribute and that's what is kind of driving these gothic plots as well it's if, if there isn't a, a kind of um, such an imagination then um, the narrative energy will also be lost so what Austin does is she kind of picks up on that gives energy to the narrative and then kind of um, you know uh, kind of uh, bursts the uh, expectation of the readers. Yet there are true dangers to the happiness of uh, Catherine in this novel too, especially when she concocts a gothic explanation for the death of Mrs. Tilney. Uh, if you remember the novel, uh, General Tilney's wife is dead. Um, is, uh, and, and therefore, uh, Catherine kind of imagines that, you know, she could have died due to some kind of um, role on the part of um, General Tilney. So, Tilney, uh, Tilney's son, Henry Tilney, gets to know about um, the thoughts of Catherine Merlin and he chastises, scolds uh, Catherine, tells her off for believing that General Tilney may be akin to a Radcliffian villain. And, and the narrator tells us of Catherine's state. The visions of romance were over. 
and this is a quote from the novel, Catherine was completely awakened. Henry's address, short as it had been, had more thoroughly opened her eyes to the extravagance of her late fancies than all their several disappointments had done. Than all their several disappointments had done. Most grievously was she humbled. Most bitterly did she cry. So Henry's um, narrative, the brief narrative, kind of shatters all the fancies of Catherine Morland, which she had been developing in her mind because of her book reading, Gothic uh, fiction reading. And the impact of this kind of novel reading is on their romance, um, at least uh, when it comes to the relationship between um, Catherine and Henry Tilney and the way Catherine sees that uh, relationship. For her, everything is over because Henry is disappointed and she is humbled and she thinks um, that, you know, that that romance is no longer there. And most bitterly did she cry over that grave mistake. So Gothic has an impact on the happiness of um, the heroine, but in a very, very different way um, to the other Gothic fiction that were very popular in the late 18th century. So Catherine has neglected to consult her own understanding, her own sense of the probable, and consequently has allowed what she has read, rather than the evidence of her own eyes, to script her vision of life. This failure to exercise reason alongside her imagination jeopardizes her potential romance with Henry and the fulfillment and joy such a union may bring. So what is being criticized by Austen in this moment is... Uh, Catherine Morland's inability to exercise reason alongside her imagination. So she had not been rational in judging her experiences at Northanger Abbey. So it is this inability to be reasonable puts um, her romantic relationship with Henry Tilney into great danger. And, and she is worried that there could be no fulfillment and joy uh, because that union between them could not possibly uh, happen. So you can see how uh, you know uh, Austin celebrates the utility of reason against excessive imagination. Excessive imagination is condemned. Excessive, um, you know, romantic principles are also uh, condemned. I uh, mean, um, Austin, for example, if you think back to uh, uh, Pride and Prejudice, um, you can see how Lydia is is criticized. So, excess um, is always kind of criticized by Austin in her works. But there is a different kind of horror in um, Northanger Abbey with relation to General Tilney. Let's see what that is. Catherine realizes that the horror of her surrounding society is not that men directly murder their wives, but rather the far more commonplace truth that people marry for money and make their spouses miserable. Once she understands General Tilney's real motivations, his social secret, she feels morally justified in pursuing a romantic relationship with Henry despite his father's initial objections. The general's unjust interference, so far from being really injurious to their felicity, was perhaps rather conducive to it by improving both their knowledge of each other and adding strength to their attachment. So let's take the first point that had been put forth by the critic here. The first um, point that Miller uh, puts forth here is that there is not perhaps a gothic horror in Northanger Abbey, but there is a social horror and what is that social horror? The horror is that people marry for money and, um, you know, uh, and they make their spouses miserable. So this kind of nightmare is there within domesticity and that uh, perhaps is there um, in General Tilney's um, household too. And once she realizes that General Tilney threw her out because she was not rich enough to marry her son, uh, his social secret became um, apparent and Catherine feels that she has every right to pursue a romantic relationship with Henry, uh, despite the objections of his father. So 
when they are separated and that separation also kind of um, you know leads to a better understanding uh, between Catherine Morland and Henry Tilney and um, this uh, father figure uh, General Tilney had been um, you know uh, conducive to their happiness felicity means happiness uh, instead of completely uh, preventing it so you can see how um, the got horror gets um, you know represented as uh, societal horror in Austen's uh, novel as Richard uh, Lansdowne notes just when both the heroine and the readers have learned to recognize and dismiss gothic imaginings General Tilney returns to the scene in a towering rage and throws Catherine Morland out of his house Montoni style though uh, Monto um, Though Montoni himself is more given to locking up a woman rather than evicting them. So what we uh, see is that uh, Catherine Morland is thrown out of Northanger Abbey when uh, General Tilney realizes that she is not very uh, rich, that she cannot bring a very wealthy dowry to the marriage. Um, he gets rid of her and uh, this uh, at act of um, General Tilney reminds the readers of Montoni's behavior who kind of operates um, on, on, on um, the, the idea of uh, money. Money becomes the driving principle for all his acts um, in that novel. So uh, this kind of attitude of General Tilney makes us compare him to Montoni himself, but uh, the critic very um, you know, uh, um, humorously points out that Montoni has a habit of locking up women whereas General Chinley just kicks them out. So you can see uh, there are symbolic comparisons between Montoni and General Tilney in the way they kind of put money before anything else. Consequently, readers see that as Austin parodies the Gothic, she remains entrenched in some of its tropes. Yet her reliance on the Gothic, even after she claims to abandon it, also indicates that reason alone cannot provide a full and adequate understanding of human contact. So what becomes apparent in Northanger Abbey is that even though Austin um, parodies it, she also kind of retains um, the tropes of the parody in order to uh, kind of uh, make her point. So uh, the reliance on the Gothic is essential to kind of illustrate the triumph of romance in this particular uh, novel. The reliance of um, on the Gothic is useful to kind of exhibit the social horrors that are undercurrent in this novel. And, and this kind of um, uh, shows us that um, imagination cannot be completely uh, rejected from uh, this kind of fictional uh, universe. Reason alone cannot provide a full and adequate understanding of human contact. Instead, there needs to be a kind of an imaginative discourse in order to drive home the point about um, rationality and reasonable um, and proper human uh, relationships. For example, uh, feelings such as those associated with romance cannot be completely accounted for within social education. They have a more individual, imaginative component that may even conflict with social demands. Hence, although the novel concludes with Catherine's realization of social than personal secrets, the text also ends with a revelation of Henry Tilney's deeply personal secret, his love for Catherine. So what the critic is uh, here um, arguing is that um, imagination cannot be completely removed from um, uh, re uh, emotions such as romance because um, those kind of uh, relationships and emotions uh, does have a more individual imaginative component which may even kind of be in uh, contradiction with social demands so you can see how um, you know, General Tilney has this uh, social demand for money from um, Catherine Moreland, which she cannot uh, provide. All she has is her affection, her um, romance for um, his son, uh, General uh, Tilney's son, Henry. So what we understand from uh, Northanger Abbey uh, is that, uh, yes, Catherine Morland undergoes a kind of an education. Uh, she does learn to read uh, reality um, through her own uh, experiences. She does um, 
kind of use um, rationality to assess people at the end of the day, by the end of the novel, but romance and imagination cannot be completely, um, you know, uh, removed from this kind of society because um, ultimately romance and imagination uh, are essential to kind of uh, assert the importance of rationality itself and it it is also useful to bring to the surface other secrets for example um, Catherine uh, realizes the deeply personal secret of um, Henry Tilney that uh, he is in love with her so uh, there should be a kind of realization that uh, imagination is important and in this novel uh, Austen uses the imagination that she derives from uh, gothic fiction she uh, kind of harnesses a lot of gothic tropes in order to drive home the point that um, you know uh, one should not lead um, lives based on the plots and, and setting and characters uh, of uh, gothic fiction so Catherine must become attuned to the social sphere, but Henry must admit the existence of feelings in opposition to that sphere, and thus the rhetoric of the Gothic, which is allied with the world of the individual imagination, is still present at the end of Austen's text and retains an important educate important educative function. So there is an educative function. Uh, we understand that Austen um, educates. Catherine Moreland uh, out of her obsession uh, with uh, gothic novels. The readers are indirectly told not to look at the real world through gothic eyes. Um, and there is this uh, subtext as well, uh, which is that England is not continental Europe. Um, English Christians are not like the Catholics that one finds in um, uh, continental Europe that is represented in gothic fiction. Uh, England's law are better laws so all these um, uh, concepts are educated through this uh, novel and uh, Catherine Moreland becomes um, you know the figure through we through which um, all these ideas are communicated to uh, uh, to the audience so that's that's one thing that the other point is that there is romance uh, which is a uh, kind of uh, carried out using this discourse of gothic uh, by uh, Catherine Moreland. Uh, she goes to Northanger Abbey because she's fascinated by that, um, you know, uh, house. And, and that kind of introduces her further to, um, to the world of Henry, to the mind of Henry. So gothic has its detrimental effects to Catherine Moreland, but Gothic is the means um, by which she also kind of uh, reaches a happiness ultimately with um, Henry Tilney. So Gothic tropes cannot be completely set aside and, and rejected um, as, as, as sometimes uh, some critics argue that this novel completely exorcises, um, you know, uh, the Gothic um, ideas uh, from this uh, novel. But but that is not true because um, the Gothic here is also used to, to capture the social horrors and the domestic horrors that are present in all societies, not just in, in continental, but in English society. So that is the radical idea that Austin is communicating here in this novel. We do not have the kind of um, uh, villains who lock up um, women um, demanding their property, but we do have, uh, you know, father figures who uh, kick women out of um, their realm because they don't have the adequate um, financial status to enter. So in that regard, England is not much different from the continental villains that you can see in the mysteries of Adolfo. So General Tilney can be a perfect Montoni figure, but not uh, in the ways he really kind of carries out his evil plans. But you can see the kind of oppression that he can bring into the lives of people who are under his influence. For example, uh, his son Henry Tilney. Um, so and, and and the way he kind of unceremoniously um, kicks out Catherine Moore. Moreland um, asks her to leave the house is, is something 
evil and cruel and and these attributes are symbolically um you know uh, associating uh, henry chilney with uh, count montoni so money is the driving motive for uh, the villains that you see in um in, in all these uh, gothic romances from con uh, set in continental europe and the same factor is also kind of motivating uh, figures such as um general tilney he may be a general and not a count but that doesn't make him um entirely different um from the other gothic villains so what austin is consciously or unconsciously illustrating to us is that um, you know despite all these facades there is a connection uh, between um english uh, father figures and um italian um, uh, patriarch so um, the, the, there might be a, a bit of a difference in in terms of the setting uh, in terms of perhaps the loss but the reality the ground reality is entirely different and it does have a lot of effect on the uh, happiness of young women so gothic tropes are fascinating uh, because they are uh, malleable they can be applied used exploited harnessed in different ways ways in all these fiction um so even a parody even a parody which northanger abbey is uh, considered to be even a parody does make use of the gothic tropes to drive home the point that um patriarchs must not control the happiness of uh, young people such as henry tilney and catherine morlin and that money should not be the most important concern for these figures in um you know uh, arranging marriages so this kind of um education is also being carried out in um this uh, novel so gothic is an extremely useful uh, mode to um to kind of uh, drive home all these points uh, about society thank you for watching i'll continue in the next session